Throughout New York, clergy members, lay leaders, and faith-based activists from every faith tradition are working to create positive change for our own communities and the city as a whole. But all too often, we find ourselves working alone, without a strong network of interfaith ties or knowledge of the city's civic institutions. One way you can gain the tools you need to make a difference is through the Interfaith Center of New York's Interfaith Civic Leadership Academy, an intensive seven-month leadership development program about to launch its third year. I'm Hanadi Doda, the Director for Community Partnerships at the Interfaith Center of New York. And in this episode of Interfaith Matters, we're going to hear from some diverse faith leaders who have been through the Academy to see how the program has enhanced their professional careers and even their personal lives. For any faith-based activists listening who are interested in growing your knowledge and network of professionals working for change in New York City, we're accepting applications for the next Academy right now. Please see www.interfaithcenter.org. The Interfaith Civic Leadership Academy is a tuition-free seven-month program that meets on almost a weekly basis. For the upcoming cohort, we will be meeting three times a month and will alternate between meeting online and in person. The workshops provided in this program cover an array of topics, such as diverse models of civic engagement and religious leadership, legislative and policy advocacy strategies, and how to make their voices heard in City Hall in Albany, strategies for grassroots community organizing to create long-lasting change in their neighborhoods, training on leadership skills and developing their own unique talents as faith leaders, and of course, interfaith dialogue. Our fellows then apply what they've learned in community projects, working individually or collaboratively to contribute to the civic life of New York. Each fellow receives $500 in funding to support their community project, as well as $500 personal stipend to recognize their time, commitment, and cover their expenses. I recently talked with three fellows from the last Academy cohort of the year 2020-2021. First, I talked with Ayoka Mayana Johnson, who is from the Israelite community and is the founder of Genesis to Ministries, and Hanashim. Here's what she had to say about what inspired her to apply to ICLA. How did you hear about the Interfaith Civic Leadership Academy? I was actually invited to speak um, at a panel for during Marcus Garvey's birthday by the MICA Institute, and I was introduced to ICLA through that, that venue, and I'm super excited. I was really, really honored to be offered an invitation to apply and then ecstatic that I was accepted. I remember when we received your application, we were very excited about it, <laughs> and we were so glad to have you accept the position and be a part of our program. What were you doing at the time, and how did uh, ICLA appeal to you? Well, actually, um, through the fact that I am so community-oriented, I work a lot with women. Um, I was I'm very, very interested in communicating with women because I, as the program that we thought up together... Um, sacred spaces aren't always safe spaces, and, and that's kind of the theme. And so since that's the work that I do in the community, it was amazing to partner with ICLA to learn the different ways that um, the government can assist, that the existing agencies can exist, the different um, approaches to making that cause really get out there in a really kind of tangible way. Um, that was really important to me. Uh, the other thing that I want to say that what ICLA um, really did to add to what was going on at the time was there was a portion where we had a moment to do some introspection and some self-investigation to see what kind of leader we were. And that was super, super revealing. It was a really, really great moment for me. So it, it, I really appreciated that experience. For me, it was like a moment that uh, being able to look at different leadership styles and see yeah. how we all fall very differently on the spectrum of leadership and how our facilitation skills come to life. And um, I thought it was a very interesting segment and look forward to kind of, you know, making sure that that's part of our theme as part of the ICLA. Yeah. I still go back to like, I find myself going back and referencing to say, okay, that's me doing too much of this over here. I need to kind of pull back 
and you know, honestly, it, it got me to look for people that balance me out. So, because I know where I might get a little excessive, I need to be anchored in certain spaces. So it was, it's a really good kind of reminder. And I, I, I kind of keep that handy. And I really, because for me, that kind of accountability is a huge part of what I do. You know, it's a huge part of being transparent, a part of being authentic and sincere to the community that I serve in, in a space where very often, you know, they don't feel heard, they don't feel understood, and they don't need to feel overwhelmed by the leader. What other impacts would you say the program has had on you and your um, sort of community relations and your community building? I think that one of the more most important, and I mean, there are many, many, many important parts of the program, but it because it's an interfaith program, the exposure to all of the other faith traditions and the way they walk out their faith and the needs of the community, it was great to see how many of these streams were the same. They were all kind of different streams into the same pool of faith and the same, we have the same basic ideas about morality and ethics and things that are important to our people and to the overall community. And I think that was really, really important to see because we tend to focus so much on our differences. In the past, the ICLA has been in person. This was the first time that we went 100% remote and online. And I know that that sort of affected how people's networking was happening throughout the program. But did you feel that you were, even though we were online, did you feel that there was some sort of flexibility and ability to create networks and building like relationships throughout the program with the other fellows? Oh, for sure. For sure. Especially because we were online, there were so many text messages going back and forth, emails yeah. going back and forth, and everybody was always CC'd or included. So there was less of an opportunity for someone to be left out or left behind. So I think that there was some definite benefits to us being remote because there was a kind of dependency on the interdependency of the program. Yeah. So I think that was maybe one of the um, unexpected but wonderful benefits of being remote. If there was some, uh, you know, words of wisdom that you could share with potential fellows, what would that be about the program? To be open, um, to be open. It's, it's going to feel unfamiliar. There'll be times when it's uncomfortable, but to kind of lean into that space to be um, especially like my faith community is not mainstream, as they would yeah. call it. So there's a lot of misconceptions, maybe a lot of curiosity about what we do and who we are. And sometimes I feel uncomfortable. Like I don't want to be like, you know, the the spokesperson or the oddity, you know, the curiosity and the but I think what what I would be saying to maybe potential fellows who belong to what others would consider a French community to not worry about it. It's a very safe space. It's a very welcoming, very warm space. And that the fellow will probably be quite surprised at how, how um, similar everyone is. And I think that because ICLA is uniquely um, inviting, that it's a good place to, to introduce and to make others aware of their community, their faith traditions, and um, how we contribute to the overall, they contribute to the overall fabric of the community and, and faith communities. Do you mind delving in a little bit more about your faith community and identity? No. And Actually, so the Hebrew Israelite community is often juxtaposed to mainstream Judaism. Which is interesting because that community is not, you know, entirely hegemonic either. It's not, a, it's not a monoglyphic. It's not one way. So it's really interesting to say, um, to hear it said that the Israelite community are not mainstream Jews, or more. I think for me, what's more hurtful or more offensive to hear is they're not accepted by the Jewish community as you know authentic Jews. Yeah. And the thing about that is that, to be honest, we're not looking to be authenticated by another faith group. Talking about one, educating the community and the safe, the safe and sacred space that you did for your final project. If you don't mind, just walking us through what that was like and really what the outcome was. Because of my training with ICLA and, and other groups, 
I am working with um, the chaplain at my hospital for working with moms who are experiencing, sadly, fetal demise and postpartum depression and all of those things. And so a lot of the training that I got at ICLA um, really is shining through in these projects while we are creating programs for mothers and families that are extremely vulnerable in this space with, the ch with pastoral care. And the reason why that's so super important is that usually when moms are feeling um, kind of vulnerable in this place in that moment, medical personnel might feel that they need to, they need to call in social work and psychology and that looks terrible on your patient chart when all you really kind of needed was pastoral care or someone from your faith traditions to talk to. And so putting that in place and, and working with um, understanding of the chapel, the director of um, pastoral care at my hospital really loves the idea of the fact that sacred spaces are not always safe spaces and really kind of using that as a springboard in how we create these programs. And looking back on workshops led by partner organizations such as the Advocacy Institute and Coro New York Leadership Center, I asked Dharmacharya Nanta from the Tree Ratna Buddhist Order about his experience and what takeaways from the ICLA were most valuable to him. I, I feel a lot more networked in, in New York now. Um, as a result, like 15 or so fellows who were really engaged in their communities, I feel a lot more um, yeah, connected with, with um, with, with people here, as well as the, the you guys at ICNY um, and the trainers as well, because there were a lot of incredible trainers that we yeah. um, we met and were, were exposed to. Um, and I think there were some aspects of the program. Some of it was familiar, I think. Um, there was, you know, some techniques and styles which I was I was familiar with. Some some things were kind of new uh or a blend of the new and the familiar like especially in understanding civic government or uh, and, and how new york state and new york city works there was this um kind of leadership mapping matrix i'm probably getting yeah. the name wrong the coral from coral i think right yeah and i was really interested in that i mean i do i do like those kind of leadership models and and i felt like this this one in particular shed new light for me on you know who I am and how I behave in, right. a, in a leadership role and and how others are as well it definitely one of the biggest things I got out of the uh the program was 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 building the connections with other faith leaders and not just you know not just any faith leaders but faith leaders who have a particular interest in social engagement sure. um so I feel like that was one of the the biggest takeaways even though we did it on zoom you know even yeah. though we couldn't meet in person it still had that um bonding effect and to you know and kind of going through a program a leadership program like that together where we're all learning and discussing and sharing the, the challenges and uh, that, we're, that we're all facing in our various roles there's a lot of peer support that, that um, I got from that. Looking at all the ways that we as New Yorkers and faith leaders and people of faith kind of wanting to make change in our city and understanding the nuances of how to make those changes and really just the steps to take, I think is very important. Um, if there was one thing, one major highlight for you. I, I think it's meeting like-minded people and yeah. being, in, being in a community of like-minded people. Um, not everyone in my tradition is socially oriented. And there was, you know, there was some rude awakenings in the midst of the pandemic sure. of just how some people in my tradition aren't, aren't so oriented. So it was a bit surprising to me that, um, you know, to hear views of people saying kind of like, oh, this isn't really something we do. We don't really do this. We're, we're more, we, you yeah. know, we're into it. We're into meditation and teaching the Dharma and um you know all this other stuff it's political or it's you know it's just too too it's just not really what we, and, 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 and that's bizarre to me it's really it's really bizarre unfortunately you know most people i'm surrounded by in my buddhist community here don't have those views it's more like in different sure. locations around the world but but so I, I i think that affiliation with people 
and maybe it's pro perhaps more of an American thing as well. Like that, you know, civil rights is really, you know, in yeah. the blood of people much more because you've had to fight perhaps much more um, for rights here. And, and, and then that's in, been interwoven with faith communities too. Yeah. So things here that are sort of like just givens. It's so, it's so obvious that those things would be intertwined. I, I don't know because, you know, I'm obviously still don't know the landscape nowhere near as well as you guys do, but um, it's, it's just, yeah, that was really supportive to me. For the program, I hadn't had much experience of working with um, diverse faith leaders. And, and in my roles where I'd been supporting different community groups or, or, or young people, they, you know, it's, it's done in different cultures. Um, so they might, you know, there might be a blend of Christian or Muslim or Buddhist or Hindu, but that wasn't the focus. Um, and, 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 and being, and me being more in a kind of manager, project manager type of role okay. meant that I wasn't so hands-on um, with, with that process. So I, yeah, so I didn't have a lot of experience of, of working with uh, um, people from diverse faith traditions. And yeah, I did find that there was a lot um, that I learned and a lot of, a lot of synergies, a lot of, of similar understandings as well. Um, uh, that, could, that at times could be surprising um, that I was yeah, pleasantly surprised that, yeah, someone from a very different faith tradition or I wouldn't kind of necessarily think, oh, we'd have a lot in common. I found out that, oh yeah, we do, we do. There is a lot of um, common ways of, of seeing the world and um, yeah, in terms of approach or, or how, we, how we apply our faith, you know, coming from principles of, yeah, compassion and understanding and, uh, yeah. yeah, wanting to just want to do good in the world. I really want to know a little bit more about how the program helped set up your project and how you felt like it was, was it successful to you? What was the outcome? Um, I know that each of us or each of you had to write a um, sort of final um, report on your projects and they're all fantastic, but I would love for you to talk a little bit more about how uh, the ICLA helped you set up your project and really if it helped you throughout it. I did a project that focused on mental health of, of um, faith communities and it wasn't what I was intending to do. Um, I was thinking I would do something around climate and uh, 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 yeah and, and the environment but um, given that we were in the middle of the pandemic and the, and the kind of massive uh, mental health crisis that we were and still in, still are in um, I decided to draw on my skills as a mindfulness teacher and see if I could, um, uh, yeah, I guess offer mindfulness to faith communities. And the project had different levels to it. Yeah. And the, the um, ICNY was really helpful and the program as well in conceptualizing the different levels. And, and it was like there was, you know, there were big circles or big, big project ideas, which I think which is still live. And if I had like a year or two, um, um, those, those goals could be really, um, you know, something that's probably more realistically achievable in that time frame, um, given, given the time constraints that I had to sort of chunk it down. But I think some of the skills we were learning around advocacy and influencing um, and, and my background as well, got me into thinking around trying to get mindfulness more into the mainstream Right. And, um, uh, and 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 more on the radar of, of decision makers, and uh, and I'd, I'd still love to see that happen. Um, but I feel like, yeah, like I said, I had to chunk it down a bit and just focus a bit more practically on um, perhaps kind of like the, the the sort of more direct delivery and and awareness raising around um, the benefits of mindfulness among faith communities. So. I ran some cycles of an eight-week program, mindfulness-based stress reduction, um, which is a kind of classic program, secular program. So it's kind of a bit of a mind bender. So it's sort of drawn from Buddhist and Hindu roots, you know, like focus a lot on mindfulness, meditation, yeah. yoga, um, and a lot of group work as well. And then that over the last 40 years in the mindfulness boom has become a secular initiative but then offering that back out to faith communities, um, which was incredibly successful. One unique aspect of the Academy is interfaith engagement, including site visits to various fellows as congregations. 
When I talked with Sati Gurdia, a Hindu, and the general secretary of the Tri-State Arya Samaj, she emphasized her interfaith experiences during the academy and how that informed her wanting to participate more in interfaith events in the future. During the time that we were there, uh, I've learned about all the different faiths because during, in the class, we had people of different faiths there. And there was many things that I've noticed was in common with my faith, but there were some things that were um, di different. And um, I was very eager to learn. And I also learned about the mindfulness class that yeah. And one of the students offered. Uh, be, before, um, I had attended a few interfaith pro, um, programs, but not in this extent mm -hmm. that we had during the classes. It was a lot more. And um, so it encouraged me to, in the future, to be highly um, active in participating in these programs to actually, to live in a better society, you know, because, you know, our society is diversified and um, we need to understand about people's faith and culture. And this program actually did that. I remember that during the program, you were one of uh, three fellows that were Hindu, but of a different sect. Each of you were from a different sect within the faith tradition. Did you feel that throughout the program, you were able to, uh, one, safely, talk about your faith tradition and to feel as if other people were very receptive to kind of what your faith tradition has. If you remember that, I believe it was our first session where we asked everyone to um, share a, a text or a scripture from their, their faith tradition. Do you remember that one? So do you feel like you were able throughout the program to um, speak about your faith tradition and have it um, understood in a manner that people were, were excited to hear more? Absolutely, <laughs> because the, as you mentioned about, um, you had three of us of um, Hindu faith, but we practice differently. Yeah. And um, so the one that um, they asked practice, that's the more prominent and popular way of people practicing Hinduism. And um, myself and um, Vijay, we are like more considered minority <laughs> to be us. But um, overall in the class, I think we managed to put forward our, system, our faith system, our belief. And then we find out we have so much more in common again. And um, for us to actually, we are all of the same Hindu faith. I would love for you to talk a little bit more about your project and how you were able to make it happen and on during COVID and the height of it, and you were able to connect with like the senior citizens of your community and really provide them with something that was lacking in that time. I mean, the project we had was in, in Zoom and um, we actually um, reached out to the director of the senior centers and um, get asked them to get involved in this upcoming program, which we had in December. Um, <clears throat> which was right before Christmas. So that was like a nice time to entertain them because normally years prior to this, we usually have a, for a, a actual in-center program for the seniors to entertain them during, Christmas, during the holiday season. So that they couldn't have, so that this is an alternative that we put, us, put out there on Zoom for them to be entertained by our group, by the Tri-State Arya Samaj group. And we asked other artists to join us too, and they were more than willing to be there. And overall, um, in the program, we had a variety program. We had the bingo for mm -hmm. them, which they really enjoyed. And then we had singing. We had them to participate as well. Some of them spoke about their experiences during the Zoom time. and expressed that they couldn't wait to get back to the senior center, who I saw on Tuesday as well, and thanked me <laughs> that we put that program out. And, um, <clears throat> I, I, and then at the end, uh, we promised them we'll give them a gift bag, which we prepared with a nice blanket and um, mask and, <clears throat> uh, 
uh, uh, with sanitizers. So overall, it was pretty successful. Yeah, you were one of the first fellows to actually kind of dive in and really do it and get it done. And it was uh, inspirational to see you connect with oftentimes members of the community that I don't want to say are forgotten, but are put on the side. So to see that your fo your focus was on the senior citizens and really kind of interacting with them on in a way. And I know it was a bit challenging because of the technological aspect, because not everyone was so in tune with using new technology, Zoom and all these different aspects. So that was beautiful to see that you uh, invested your time and your resources into making that project happen. So kudos to you for doing that. Though you've only heard from three of the Academy Fellows here, graduates from the Academy come from virtually every cultural and faith community in every borough of New York City. If you are a faith-based activist, whether a member of clergy or lay leader, who is interested in growing your knowledge and network of professionals working for change in New York City, we encourage you to submit an application to the next program, which begins in October. Applications are due by September 20th. See our website for more information, www.interfaithcenter.org. Thank you for listening to Interfaith Matters. This episode of Interfaith Matters was hosted by me, Hanadi Dola, and produced by Kevin Childress.